A ruthless grab for power tears a city apart. A crime family splits in two as the young and the old fight to the death. The FBI is caught in the middle as they infiltrate the syndicate in a desperate attempt to end the brutal war raging on the streets of Philadelphia. In the 1990s, Philadelphia became the scene of a bloody vendetta. The streets erupted in mob warfare. Authorities feared innocent people would be caught in the crossfire. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents launched a complex and risky surveillance operation. Their mission? To bring down a notorious crime family and to stop a brutal turf war before more people were killed. nineteen ninety a quiet morning in south philadelphia pennsylvania joe andruzzi is being wired by the fbi he's a twenty-year-old accounting student at la salle university and he's in trouble he's been betting on football through a mafia bookmaker he was winning at first but his luck turned sour he owes the mob one thousand dollars It's a debt he cannot pay. You understand? I don't think you do, son. I don't think you got it at all. But you understand what's going on here. In way I'm over his head money. and afraid for his life, Andruzzi contacted the FBI and asked for help. Get the money, kid. South Philly is a tough place. Not the kind of place where you want to cross the mob. La Cosa Nostra, the Italian syndicate of organized crime families, runs a profitable and bloody business there. Gambling, loan sharking, and extortion rackets. For years, South Philly was run by Angelo Bruno, known as the Gentle Don because of his dislike of violence. He took over the city in the 1950s. He was brutally murdered in 1980. The man suspected of being behind the hit was Nicodemo Scarfo. Nicky Scarfo took over Bruno's empire. He was a cold-hearted killer who ruled the city by violence. But now Nicky Scarfo is in jail. The FBI wants to find out who is running the Philadelphia mob while the boss is behind bars. Andruzzi's problem with the loan shark gives the FBI the perfect opportunity to collect new information on the organization. The college student meets with the bookmaker. He plays his part perfectly and is introduced to Salvatore Sparaccio, a known member of the Philadelphia Mafia. I don't have the money. You don't have the money. FBI Special Agent Jim Marr was the case agent on this investigation. Salvatore Sparaccio didn't make any overt threats, but the implied threat, I'm the boss of the family, you gotta pay. I want $120 a week for 10 weeks. The boss offers a repayment plan. Although the mob is charging little more interest than a credit card company, the penalty for defaulting on the loan has a far higher price. Nikki, here, take some cake off to your wife. Hey, thanks, Bob. For the next 10 weeks, the FBI gives Andruzzi the money to make his payments. And each time he takes the money to the bookmaker, the FBI records the conversation, building their case against Salvatore Sparaccio. Each payment is evidence of, of the crime, of racketeering. But the FBI is not interested in making low-level gambling arrests. 
we going, huh? They have a much bigger target. I'm sure it's all there. The ultimate goal is to destroy the Philadelphia Cosa Nostra family as a crime problem. Thank you. Okay. Good hey, Boogie, you know so much. The tactics we use are to attack the hierarchy. The, the 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 structure the the structure is the is the target and we we attack the target through through the hierarchy. They need more information, so on Christmas Day, when they know it will be closed, the FBI breaks into the bakery shop. We proved to the judge that gambling activity and loan sharking activity was taking place in an Italian bakery. The judge authorized us to put microphones in. For the next several months, the FBI records the conversations inside the bakery. And we began listening to conversations of Salvatore Sparaccio, who was claiming to be the boss of the Philadelphia Cosa Nostra family. Although Sparaccio claims to be the head of the family, the FBI wire soon makes it clear that Sparaccio is not one of the big Philadelphia mafia bosses. He is little more than an employee, but the FBI doesn't know who he's working for. Thinking he can lead them to his boss, the FBI surveillance tracks Sparaccio to a law office in Camden, New Jersey. There he meets with other members of the Philadelphia Mafia, including one man well known to the FBI John Stanfa. John Stanfa is a Sicilian immigrant and a made member of the Sicilian Mafia. He worked as a driver for the late Angelo Bruno, AKA the Gentle Don, former head of the Philadelphia family. Stanfa was implicated in the murder of the former Mafia boss in 1981 and was apprehended in Maryland. He was convicted of perjury in his testimony before a grand jury that was probing Bruno's death. He went to jail for eight years. When he was released, the Philadelphia Mafia put out a contract on his life for the killing of Bruno. Special Agent Fred Walsh is a member of the FBI's organized crime squad. Only through the intercession of his Gambino uh, associates up in New York, uh, the contract was taken off him and he was allowed to live. After Nicky Scarfo went to jail, Stanford returned to Philadelphia. He went to work in the construction business and laid low for a while. And he was relatively quiet. So when he started to come to power and we started to notice he was making a name for himself, it came as a kind of a surprise to us. Thanks to the cooperation of the young college student, the FBI has now identified the man they believe is running organized crime in Philadelphia. We had put away the previous boss and most of the hierarchy of the family. We felt if we could put Stanford away that we would go a long way towards the ultimate goal of, of eliminating the crime, the uh, Philadelphia family as a crime problem. On the street, informants confirmed the FBI suspicion that John Stanford is the new boss of the Philadelphia Mafia. Once you determine that an individual like Stanford has taken the family over, you want to see how he intends to run it. You uh, contact your informants, see what they can provide. Stanford maintains a low profile. He runs things like the Gentle Don before him. He engages in traditional mob activities such as loan sharking, gambling, and extortion. The FBI wants to find out where he is conducting business. According to FBI informants, High-level secret mafia meetings are being held in the lawyer's conference room. Informants uh, told us that that's where they were meeting, that they felt secure there. Uh, since it was a lawyer's office, they felt secure there from FBI eavesdropping. We decided that it would be a very, very good place uh, to put microphones. Agents prepare an affidavit to wire the premises. We recognize that intruding into a lawyer's office was extraordinary. The affidavit had to go down to the FBI headquarters. The director of the FBI personally signed off on it. A federal judge gives the FBI the green light. 
Agents install a hidden video camera outside the law office so they can monitor anyone who enters or leaves the building. How about now? A special FBI entry unit will install a hidden microphone inside the law offices. Agents make a surreptitious entry into the second floor suite. In terms of, uh, of the actual entry into the premises, it's what I regard to be one of the most dangerous things the FBI does because you're, you're, you're burglarizing someone else's property. Although you have authority to be there, the person, if you, if you encounter someone, he doesn't know that you have authority to be there. Inside, the agents fear they've been discovered. An armed deputy sheriff is inside the building. The night before we went in, the uh, re-elect the sheriff campaign moved into the ground floor. The agents making the entry were surprised by a deputy sheriff. Fortunately, uh, they were able to conceal themselves. He got in and got out before there was any problem. Technicians install a microphone in the conference room. The surveillance agents will first try to identify each suspect and determine their roles in the organization. There's 18 FBI agents who do nothing but physical and photographic and video surveillances. Most of their work they did for the organized crime squad. So we've got a lot of manpower out there, and we've got people who, who know how La Cosa Nostra works. And we can a lot of times figure out a hierarchy just by watching the way that they behave towards one another. That coupled with information coming from informants can tell us who the hierarchy is. Agents monitoring the conversations have to match the voice on the wire to the face in the video surveillance. John Stanford was very easy. He had a very heavy Italian accent. Uh, so it was very easy to figure out uh, when he was speaking. But the agents have a problem. The conversations we intercepted in the office indicated to us that they were uh, leaving the conference room and going somewhere. After going to all the trouble to plant the wire, the mob boss moves the meetings. The surveillance agents will have to find out where the meetings are now taking place. They will have to place another bug. They're gone. They're somewhere else. A few days later, the FBI learns from an informant that a high-level sit-down is about to take place at the law office between John Stanfa and several associates. They need to get the new bug in place before the meeting. But they don't know where the meeting will be held. Agents dispatch an undercover detective to follow Stanfa into the office. Philadelphia detective Mark Panero gets the job we try to come up with a reason to actually go into the law firm to get a, a closer look at what was going on. So we had come up with a cover story uh, utilizing a, a name of an attorney that we knew had left that firm. But it does not go exactly as planned. This uh, unknown individual held the door for me to go in first, which kind of set me back because I went to go in second. I want to see where they they were going before I was attended to. But I was relieved when I walked in and the receptionist greeted John Stanfa and John Stanfa told her, let him know I'm here. And uh, the receptionist immediately keyed her uh, intercom and let the lead attorney of this law firm know that John was there and to send him in. So not only was I able to get her to identify John Stanfa, I was able to stand there and watch him go down to the actual office of this lead attorney at uh, this law firm. That's good. That's real good. Okay, lock it on. Thanks. With this information, a federal court approves an affidavit for a second break-in at the office. Agents install hidden microphones in the attorney's office.
shortly after the new bugs are placed, agents hear some alarming news on the wire. The mob bosses are afraid they are being watched. They hire a private counter-surveillance contractor to sweep the law offices for bugs. If he finds a listening device, the entire operation could be destroyed. The FBI in Philadelphia is closing in on mob boss John Stanfa. They learn he is conducting mob business in an attorney's office. Agents place listening devices in the office, but Stanfa calls in a man to sweep for bugs. Agents watch as the sweeper enters the building. Their entire case could collapse if he finds their bugs. Here they come. What's going on here? But after a few tense minutes, the private contractor completes his sweep without finding anything. It sort of brought a smile to everybody's face because uh, they basically brought in an expert who didn't detect anything. So that would bring a sort of a feeling of ease on their part. And uh, I guess our expectations were that they would be even more at ease to discuss further criminal activity. Now with microphones in the conference room and the lawyer's private right. office, the information begins to come in. The FBI learns that John Stanfa is having problems with a group of young mobsters. Born and raised in South Philly, their allegiance is still with Nicky Scarfo and the Mafia regime before Stanford took over. They are known as the Young Turks. As far as they're concerned, Philadelphia is and always has been their turf. And the Young Turks deserve to be running the crime family, not newcomer John Stanfa. I always do the best job. Joey Merlino is the boss of the Young Turks. Michael Changlini is the number two man. Joey and Michael have known each other since grade school. FBI Special Agent Gary Langan is the co-case agent. They didn't like the fact that John Stanford, who they considered an outsider, would come in and take over the mob family. And so they were trying to organize their own little group, even though they were part of the overall picture. And they wanted to be in charge. Informants tell the FBI that the Young Turks are not taking orders from John Stanfa. They bragged about the, who they were and who they were aligned with. Bragged about how they were going to take the city over. They were the legitimate successors to the previous mob members under Nicky Scarfa. They were going out and shaking down um, bookmakers, drug dealers, uh, and even in shaking down legitimate businesses and uh, weren't sharing the profits, to, you know, kicking upstairs to stand for. The Young Turks feel they're entitled to run the city and the Philadelphia Mafia. The aging John Stanfa, the old world Sicilian boss, resents the ostentatious lifestyle of the Young Turks. The Young Turks, if you will, were very, very uh, flamboyant. They'd go into the clubs on Delaware Avenue, throw their weight around, push people around, uh, trade on the fact that they were connected to the local Cosa Nostra family, and in general call attention to themselves, uh, which is not a good thing. If you're running a Cosa Nostra family, you should be located Wait, 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 wait. Hey, girls, get in the car. Jake, come on. Get out of here. Start it up. Start it up. The Young Turk boss, Joey Merlino, has a different idea of how a Cosa Nostra boss should live the life. He was the kind of guy who felt that when he went into a restaurant, because of who he was, he shouldn't have to pay. Uh, this was easily adopted by his entourage, and they became a problem for everybody. There, there, was, there were fights, there were shootings, there were... It's just not the way to run a Cosa Nostra family. Uh, attracting all that attention to yourself, uh, 
the police begin to know then where you are and uh, who you are, and it's just not a good thing. John Stanford was particularly angered by the Young Turks' involvement in the sale of illegal narcotics. That was the wave of the future, and it's an easy way to make money. Um, traditionally, the mob uh, frowns upon uh, having its members engage in drug dealing. Now, that, that's not to say that they, they don't do it. They get around that by uh, having an associate or something uh, deal drugs, and then they'll tax that individual and take a percentage of it. But Stanford, you know, he thought drugs were a dirty business, and it draws a lot of attention, again, to the family. And uh, he didn't want to do that. And these guys were just uh, defying him and doing it. Once we heard that there was friction developing, we were looking to see how Stanford was going to handle it. Okay, was he going to be aggressive and, uh, you know, take extreme measures? Or was he going to try and uh, mollify these people and uh, quiet them down and get them under his uh, uh, wing, so to speak? But Joey Merlino isn't going under anyone's wing. The Young Turks strike back at Stanford. 73-year-old Joseph Gatone is one of Mafia boss John Stanford's most loyal employees. Gatone is a bookmaker, a collector of street taxes. Four gunshots shatter the daily routine of Joseph Gatone. The old man's blood marks the beginning of a deadly civil war. The FBI and the Philadelphia Organized Crime Task Force surveilled top bosses of the Philadelphia Mafia. Friction between feuding factions of the crime family increase, and a bloody civil war breaks out. Philadelphia police officers arrive at the scene of the shooting. The victim's keys are still in the ignition, and the engine is still running. Two bullets penetrated the victim's neck. A third bullet entered his temple. A fourth grazed the bridge of his nose and shattered the passenger side window. When Agent Marr arrives on the scene, police have already checked the registration of the car, but they don't yet know who the victim is. Agent Marr recognizes the victim from previous investigations. Gatone is a longtime member of the Philadelphia crime family, currently under the leadership of John Stanfa. Several of Gatone's neighbors witnessed the shooting, but no one can identify the lone hooded gunman. Special Agent Jim Marr suspects Joey Merlino's young Turks are behind the killing. Where he was killed, the manner in which he was killed, indicated to me that the Merlino faction was sending a message to Stanfa and his people, we're here and we are to be reckoned with. John does. Agents monitor their wiretaps. But no one is talking about the murder. Special Agent Fred Walls. Initially at the time that uh, this bookmaker was murdered, uh, we weren't sure who was involved. There was nothing definitive on the uh, wire after the bookmaker had been murdered. There was a reference to the fact, but nothing that would indicate to us that Stanford had a belief someone had done it or someone hadn't done it. Investigators are certain the murder is mob-related, but they have no proof. When they speak to Stanford himself, he claims to know nothing. But Stanford strikes back. Five weeks after the murder of John Stanford's bookie and tax collector, Michael Changlini, the Young Turks' number two man, is coming home after a basketball game. Two men armed with shotguns open fire. Somehow, Changlini, his wife and two children, were uninjured in the attack. Investigators recover 12-gauge shotgun shells from the front yard and shotgun pellets from the ceiling of the living room and dining room. Despite the brazen attack on Changlini and his family, he won't cooperate with the detectives. Uh, he wasn't going to say anything. 
they just don't talk to law enforcement. They, they feel they're going to handle it themselves. It's business, okay, it's, and it's none of our business. So you're not going to get anything out of them. The Young Turks' number two boss isn't talking. But the FBI suspects the attack is payback for the murder of John Stanford's bookie. After the bookmaker's uh, murder and then the attempt on Michael Cinglini, we believed that we were going to see uh, an increase in violence. There was going to be a potential mob war. Fearing this, the FBI petitions a federal court to expand the eavesdropping. In the spring of 1992, they get the court order they need. Agents place bugs in seven new locations, including lawyers' private offices, the law library, the television room, and the lunchroom. The new wires immediately start paying off. Early in May of 1992, FBI cameras catch Stanford arriving at the law office with his consigliere and Joseph Changlini, brother of the Young Turk second in command. Inside, John Stanford angrily announces that he knows the Young Turks are looking for him. They want him dead. But Stanford doesn't want a war. He wants to make one last attempt at diplomacy. His first move is to make Joseph Changlini his new underboss. I guess he thought, as a concession to them, he would be able to control them. There's a saying, uh, keep your friends close, keep your enemies even closer. This was the way to keep uh, an eye on them. But we fully anticipated that we were going to see an increase in violence, but uh, we were surprised by what did happen. Informants tell the FBI that Stanford invites Joseph Changlini's younger brother, Michael, and the young Turk boss, Joey Merlino, to a secret meeting. Here, Joey and Michael become made members of La Cosa Nostra. You have to swear to uh, place the family before anything else in your life. God, your, per you know, your, your own personal family, your mother, your father, your wife, your children. If the family calls you, you come before them. Now, as made members of La Cosa Nostra, the two young Turks enjoy special privileges. The, the benefits that come with that are that uh, you can conduct your rackets, whatever they may be, without fear of interference from someone who is not a member. The family in a dispute will always decide in your favor if you are a member and the other person is not. A member cannot be killed unless the boss of that family to which he's a member approves. For John Stanford, promoting the Young Turks is his final act of diplomacy. The FBI and the Organized Crime Task Force will keep a vigilant watch to see if Stanford's bold move stops the violence. But agents still need to collect more information about the crime family to shut them down for good. Eddie. Through an informant, they learn the law office is not the only place where Stanford and his associates are congregating. We found out that uh, Stanford had opened up a dinette next to another business he owned, which was a food uh, distribution business. And surprisingly, uh, Stanford actually worked at this place every day. You know, as a John Q. citizen, he would go to work and he actually worked there. You'd see him out there sweeping and uh, cooking and handling stuff. But he was also meeting his uh, family members there and discussing mob business. So the next step, logically, is to attempt to get a Title III bug installed in the dinette so that we can listen to the conversations he's having with uh, these uh, members and uh, associates of the family. Once the microphone is installed inside the dinette, the FBI hears that an angry John Stanford is still having problems with the Young Turks. He requests a final sit-down with Joey Merlino. Joey Merlino and Michael Changlini pay a visit to Stanford. So is there a problem? 
that problem. My show Gamblers are complaining that the young Turks are not honoring their bets. Can you be more like a Joe? You broke. Merlino assures the boss he'll fix the problem and make good on the debts. You pay the bill. And of course. The meeting ends amicably. Perhaps there can be peace within the family. Early in March, FBI surveillance agents observed Joseph Changlini and a waitress opening up the Stanford dinette. It's almost exactly one year after his brother Michael was nearly gunned down at his home. His activities were easy to document. Uh, he was regular. He, uh, he got up in the morning and he went to work. But on this morning, Joseph Changlini's routine takes a terrifying twist. Four men pull up and open fire on Changlini and the waitress, reigniting the bloody war between the old and the new mafia of South Philadelphia. On March 2nd, 1993, in South Philly, underboss Joseph Changlini and a waitress open John Stanford's diner. Shortly after 6.30 a.m., four gunmen launch an attack. Changlini is gunned down. The surveillance agent alerts FBI HQ and calls 911 for an ambulance. The FBI agent on surveillance arrives on the scene. Joseph Changlini has been shot repeatedly in the head, neck, and chest. The waitress is unharmed. Changlini has somehow managed to survive the deadly attack. Though severely wounded, he can talk. You couldn't get a statement out of him, and even if he knew who did it, he, he wasn't going to implicate anybody. He was, he was part of the mob, the omerta, the code of silence, and, and uh, they would take care of this on their own. They had to know who they were. He saw them. Uh, we suspected that it was a group from the Young Turks, and but he basically told us he didn't know anything. Hoping to identify the shooters, FBI agents review the surveillance tapes. But in the early morning darkness, the images are too dark to identify anyone. The uh, video was very grainy, very blurry. It was very hard to uh, identify with any kind of particularity. Uh, features where you would recognize who actually went in, but you couldn't see four shapes going in. Then you, you go to the uh, audio and you hear uh, screaming, and you hear shots, and then you hear uh, someone yelling, move, move, and then they exit the place and they drive away. Well, that's basically all we had. But you couldn't say with any reasonable certainty who actually went in there and shot okay. Joseph Cinglini. But agents are still surveilling the law office. In the listening post, wiretaps record a chilling conversation between Stanfa and a mob associate. John Stanfa suspects Michael Changlini was behind the attempt to kill his own brother, Joseph, at the restaurant. Yeah, Michael and Joey were on the uh, opposite sides of internal war within the Stanfa family. They were half-brothers, and it didn't make any difference. He wanted to, he thought his brother, Joey, was on the wrong side. And, He's going to take him out. For John Stanford, there is only one choice. Eliminate Joey Merlino and the Young Turks. So he starts to recruit uh, his own muscle to send them out and to start stalking these Young Turks and trying to uh, kill Joey Merlino, Michael Cinglini, and the people associated with him. Undercover FBI agents deliver a warning to Merlino and Michael Cinglini. What's going on, fellas? When we're aware of the fact that uh, uh, violence is going to occur or may occur, and we think we know who the violence is going to uh, occur against, we have an obligation to go out and warn them. 
John Stanfa is sending hit teams into the streets with orders to gun down Merlino and Cenglini. The young Turks shrug off the FBI warning. Even though they know their lives are in danger, they refuse to cooperate. The young Turks should have listened to the FBI. A Stanfa hit team tracks them down and opens fire in broad daylight. Michael Cianglini is shot in the heart and dies on the street. Joey Merlino is wounded. It is clear to the FBI that John Stanfa means business. He's uh, taken up the uh, challenge and he's retaliated with a lot of force. So that's where we are right then and there. We believe that Stanfa is responsible for it. Now we have to prove it. Three hours after the shooting, South Philadelphia police officers respond to a burning vehicle. The car matches the description of one seen by witnesses at the shooting. Police run a trace and learn that it was leased to a member of the Stanford crime family. That night, police question Phil Coletti and his wife. She tells police she reported the car stolen. Coletti says he has been home all day. The FBI views the couple's alibi with skepticism. Coletti becomes the first suspect in the shooting murder of Michael Cianglini. Several days later, the FBI gets a lead on the second shooter. The FBI had received a call from a, a, a physician who said that he had treated an individual who came in with burns. That he felt were rather suspicious. FBI agents find John Vesey at home. He, too, is a known member of the Stanford crime family. Agents ask Vesey what happened to his hand. And he says he had an accident with his barbecue grill. His hand was burned when he spilled lighter fluid. Vesey insists the burn was an accident and says he knows nothing about the murder of Michael Cianglini and the shooting of Joey Merlino. But when investigators check out the grill, they discover it runs on propane, which conflicts with Vesey's story that he was using lighter fluid when he burned himself. It aroused our suspicion and kind of uh, pointed us toward Vesey, more so than anybody else. The FBI suspects two members of the John Stanford crime family in the murder of Michael Cianglini and the shooting of young Turk boss Joey Merlino. But before the FBI can bring the shooters to justice, Joey Merlino and the young Turks try to get their own revenge. John Stanford is riding in a 1976 Cadillac Seville. He's headed south on the Schuylkill Expressway with his son Joseph and a trusted driver. A van pulls up next to the Cadillac. Two gunmen thrust 9mm machine pistols through portholes cut in the side of the van, and they open fire. A full-scale mafia civil war rages on the streets of Philadelphia. Violence explodes with a brazen rush hour attack on Sicilian mob boss John Stanfa. The gunfire misses John Stanfa, but his son Joseph is hit in the face. Stanfa's driver rams the van, forcing it off the highway. What was really brazen about it was on a highway like that, random shots could have struck and hurt, even killed any, any innocent people who were on there. Investigators have no doubt the attack on Stanfa is Joey Merlino's revenge for the murder of Michael Cianglini. It showed you the extent of the uh, violence these people were willing to employ and uh, the grudge they bore against uh, Stanfa. Police find Stanfa at the hospital. Despite the brazen attack on him and his innocent young son, the Cosa Nostra boss claims he has no idea who tried to kill them. And of course, it's the old, I don't know who would have done this to me. And we don't get anything out of him. 
It is only a matter of time before innocent civilians get caught in the crossfire. And it's time to turn up the heat on the warring mob. Any known Stanford or Merlino associate seen driving around South Philadelphia becomes the subject of a routine traffic stop. Authorities arrest eight mobsters for carrying weapons. They confiscate 380, 45, and 38 caliber semi-automatics. The FBI has no doubt the Young Turks boss ordered the hit on John Stanford, but feds can't prove it. Joey Merlino has to be yanked off the streets. The FBI arrests him for a parole violation of a 1990 armored truck robbery. With Joey Merlino off the streets, it is now time for the FBI to focus its sights on John Stanford's crew. The agents target murder suspect John Vesey. The professional hitman is one of John Stanford's soldiers. But tonight, thanks to a New Jersey firearms violation and the threat of a long jail sentence, Vesey has agreed to wear a wire for the FBI. He was a very tough, tough individual. And he did some construction work as a hired laborer for uh, John Stanford's brother-in-law, who was in construction. And he caught the eye of Stanford. And Stanford and, uh, realized this kid was a tough kid, and he could, you know, he, he intimidated people. Under Stanford, VC became a loan collector, an enforcer, and a killer. Okay. Now he claims he feels the weight of the murders he committed. All these things, plus the fact that his brother, uh, who really cared for him, was convinced that uh, John was going to go down and never see the light of day, his brother convinced him that he should cooperate. Vesey was made into the family by John Stanfa. And now he wants to get out, alive. You couldn't measure the significance of it. It was, uh, uh, it was like a coup for us that he came on board. Vesey quickly becomes comfortable wearing the wire. He has several meetings, but the conversations don't provide any new evidence against John Stanfa. He's out for a little while. He, I think he met with one or two people, nothing great. He was a little, he was a little down about the fact that he wasn't getting the conversations you know, he wanted to. He was really into it. We told him, look, don't worry about it. You know, we got a lot of time. We'll do it again till we get it right, you know. It's Friday night now, you know, you've worked long and hard for us, go home. Go home and uh, relax, don't go out, we'll hook up with you again, we'll do it again. Later that night, John Vesey runs out of luck and the FBI's organized crime task force is dealt a crippling blow. In a bloody South Philadelphia mob war, the FBI's number one informant is gunned down by mafia hitmen. And the FBI's best chance at busting up a notorious crime family is shattered. FBI Special Agent Fred Walls is devastated by the news that informant John Vesey has been shot. Well, when you hear that someone's been shot in the head, you think the worst. But against all odds, after three 22 caliber slugs slammed into his skull, John Vesey is still alive. I'm shocked. This guy was shot in the head. He's given an interview. And he proceeds to tell what happened. Earlier that night, after he removed the wire and the FBI agents went home, Vesey ran into John Stanford's underboss and one of his soldiers. They tell him, we've been looking for you. We want to uh, get you started in your own bookmaking operation. We're going to show you how to do it. We're going to go over to this location in South Philadelphia above this meat store. For Vesey, it was just another late night business meeting. He wasn't wearing the wire anymore, and he thought he had nothing to fear. He says he goes up to the room. The main guy is sitting down with him at a table, 
going over figures, telling him how to take bets, how to write stuff down. The underboss excused himself, he has to go to the bathroom. John Vesey heard the sound of the flushing toilet and the door to the bathroom opening. And then he heard the gunshots. Three 22 caliber slugs impacted John Vesey's skull, but he didn't go down. Vesey turns around, looks at the guy, and says, what the frig are you doing? And of course, the, the shooter now, he's, he's in shock. So he throws the gun down, and he pulls out a knife. Well, Vesey takes the knife away from him and cuts him, and basically incapacitates him and throws him on the ground. He turns to the uh, other guy, the main guy, who's an older guy, and the guy looks at him and he says, John, John, he said, this has all been a mis mistake. It's a, a misunderstanding. We're gentlemen here. We can settle this. And VZ says, get out of the way, or I'm going to take you down too. And against all odds, John VZ walks out of the room alive. And uh, that just goes to show you how tough this kid was. I mean, he was tough. And... Uh, the bullets went into the back of his head, and uh, we later found out they had hit the head and come around, okay? I guess the slugs weren't as strong. It was a 22 caliber, cal 22 caliber long rifle slug, and he took three in the head and survived. Two weeks later, ex-mafia hitman John Vesey makes his first appearance before the federal grand jury and testifies against his former crime family. The information he provides is invaluable to the FBI. VC names names and gives the FBI what they need to move against the Philadelphia mob. When the FBI increases the pressure, other mobsters make deals with the prosecutors and become informants for the FBI. And the dominoes begin to fall. On St. Patrick's Day in 1994, 24 suspects are arrested on racketeering charges of murder, murder conspiracy, extortion, arson, kidnapping, gambling, and obstruction of justice. Among those arrested is Frank Martinez. He's found guilty of assault and the attempted murder of John Vesey. Vincent Pagano is also arrested and found guilty of assault and the attempted murder of John Vesey. On the same day, John Stanford is arrested on racketeering charges of murder, murder conspiracy, extortion, arson, kidnapping, gambling, and obstruction of justice. It was a, a nice, clean, easy sweep. We brought the people in, and uh, we were very satisfied with it. Ultimately, 27 people are charged with conspiracy and racketeering under the RICO Act. 24 defendants are either convicted or plead guilty to the charges. I felt pretty good that we did make Philadelphia a little bit safer. Uh, it's, it was my job. Uh, it was my life's work. Um, I thought we did a good job, and I thought the, 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 that we served the citizenry very well with what we did. We took a, a very, very violent group uh, and sent a lot of them to jail for a long, long time. And we made Philadelphia a little safer. On July 9th, 1996, John Stanford is sentenced to five consecutive life terms. He is serving them at the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas.